All right, welcome back. In case you're just joining us, it's still Moneyline with me and um, Nancy. Uh, we're taking Paul Alaje right now. I know before the break we had seen Dr. Idris Omede, former president at NMA and a former commissioner of health for Akogi State. But Paul Alaje is joining me right now on Skype. Paul Alaje is the lead economist for SPM Professionals. Let's take a look at the economics of the health sector in Nigeria. Welcome, Paul, and thanks for joining us on the show today. Paul, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. Uh, Paul, where are you? Where are you? Are you in Lagos or Abuja? I'm in, huh? I'm in Abuja. Okay, okay. Now, let's take a look at this. Like I said earlier, we're looking at the health sector in Nigeria. From my analysis earlier, uh, I found out that though we've seen uh, so much monies in terms of Naira um, go to the health sector since this administration I came in in 2015, but little is going to capital expenditure. What it means is that the state of our hospitals are primary health care or health care facilities are not as much as we would like it to be. Um, as an economist, tell me the implication of improving health infrastructure in the country, even as we struggle uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic. Yeah, thank you once again. Uh, for me, the first thing that comes to mind is how Nigeria was rated when it came to health um, in terms of um, um, human development index, which is combination of income, uh, education, and health. Uh, that rating shows that out of 181 countries, Nigeria was rated 152. And one of the parameters for such rating is not how big our hospitals are but how equipped and how accessible our hospitals are. The number of doctors to, to patients or to population is horrible. When you now compare pharmacists to population, it's, it's, it's completely a different ballgame. So this is what we have observed. Over the years, we have people who truly, because health sector conversation is in three folds, capital development and accessibility of professionals. We have a lot of our professionals trained from uh, University of Ibadan to ABU to UNN to OAU. But when they finish first degree or when they become a professional, because the, there is payment disparity, what we pay them and what they will earn in countries like Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Turkey, United States, UK, they prefer to go abroad. Again, they also have the fulfillment for many of doctor, uh, for many of health practitioners, not just doctors, even nurses, when it came to issue of, when you want to talk about Canada, nurses prefer to stay there than to come here. Payment system for, for them, for health workers in Nigeria is relatively poor when compared with some other countries in the world. And because this is a, a profession that is in high demand in some developed world, and they believe that even people train there, not just because of quality, because I believe Nigeria is giving a lot of good quality in terms of education, uh, in terms of health education, and also training our doctors. They take one or two exams to, to be compliant with the countries where they want to practice. And before you know it, brain drain. A lot of people have argued, the West have argued that it is not brain drain, it is brain circulation. But we know the truth. Students in federal university in Nigeria, even if it is private university, it is nothing compared to what doctors, what medical students would have paid when they traveled out. So this is it. If you keep training people, this is the cost of government, and this is where government should, should watch very carefully. We keep training doctors in our medical schools, states and federal together, but we don't have jobs for them. So we have people whose brain has been equipped, but they don't have where to demonstrate it because of poor payment system. What they do is to relocate abroad, and most of the people that should have built for them, politicians particularly, we now have to fly abroad and pay them. And the same persons that should have trained them here at lower rates, if they have better facility and they have better pay, they will now have to add cost of transport by flying. Go to those countries, boost GDP of those countries, great job in those countries. And Nigeria, some Nigerians that are trained, we see, we see train them. So by not building our air sector, we are doing ourselves a lot of harm. In terms okay. of development of, uh, of, of uh, hospitals, the real conversation is primary health. It's not just tertiary health, I mean, ter tertiary hospitals. But when you look at COVID-19 and what it's doing, right now, a lot of people are calling it big man sickness. But if it gets to a ghetto, I'm afraid you and I may have to shed tears. Okay. Um, Paul, um, let's bring in uh, Dr. Mede. 
Uh, he's with us on the phone lines right now. Dr. Meda is the uh, former, or was the former uh, president of the Nigeria Medical Association as well as a former commission of health in Kogi State. Dr. Meda, good to have you join us on the phone lines from Adama State. Welcome to the program. Can you hear me? Thank you very much, Nancy. Good morning. Good morning. Let me start with you as uh, a medical practitioner. Uh, what do you think of the pandemic uh, so far, uh, COVID-19? I hear it's about 52 cases now. So, um, as a medical practitioner, as a former administrator of health uh, in Kogi State, do we have the capacity to fight the pandemic? Well, first and foremost, we want to start by saying that so far, so good. I think the system has tried within uh, the period at which uh, the number had increased from 1 to 56. Uh, but basically, uh, the approach has been taken at this material time. Uh, if we maintain it, we may come off it. But that that not to say that uh, there are no, a lot of inadequacies in terms of uh, our structural uh, uh, structures to keep this thing in place. We will recall that uh, what is happening now, the two places where this uh, cases are highest now are more or less like uh, side coast states in Nigeria, that Lagos and uh, Abuja. And uh, we, we keep on uh, wishing that uh, these two places which have the capacity, fairly in terms of uh, infrastructure and uh, manpower, as well as uh, basic equipment, uh, will be able to assist and uh, continue in the work they are doing. But if this had to be made through the leg and bed of this country, then we'll be done for. Uh, basically, from the fact that uh, the infrastructures are not much there in a lot of states in this country, uh, the equipment are not there, and then the manpower that will carry out the processes that are required to protect things like this are not adequately there. That is why the preventive approach, even though we're already having it, the issue is already on ground with us, but the preventive approach has been impacted by the uh, Federal Ministry of Health, the Presidential Tax Force, and the State Ministries of Health, and the NCBC. And uh, the people, as they were, the people are very key in these processes, will be the thing that will help us to portray uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic as it were in our country. But anything outside that, if we have an overwhelming one, if we can see in developed nations where we think their uh, health system is fairly okay, comparative to us, uh, the amount of damage that is going on. So basically, we pray that this thing does not go out of context. Let us not deceive ourselves that we have the capacity to contain it. This is a, this is a naked truth. Okay. Going by what has happened okay. uh, so far. And every nation is interested in seeing what it can do to herself now. So you may not get the help you think, expecting from other places when they too are trying to help themselves out. Doctor, let me stick with you a bit because it seems just like we've been saying, the chicken has come home to roost our health facility or our healthcare sector has not been in the nicest of shapes. And COVID-19 pandemic is uh, straining us uh, further. Uh, if we take a look at this uh, very quickly, which do you think will suffer the most right now? Is it about health workforce or healthcare facilities? Uh, you see, in, 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 uh, as far as health is concerned, the, the three things that you cannot do without are the three, the infrastructure, the equipment, and the manpower, all of them put together. If you have a manpower that doesn't have adequate infrastructure, then you can't do the work. If you have equipment and you don't have trained manpower, then you can't do the work. So this tripod of uh, infrastructure, equipment, and manpower, and then uh, resources, so to say, uh, funds, so to say, that will be the fourth one. Uh, this is have to be in place for you to be actually do what is expected to do. And commitment on the side one of the government, as well as uh, those that are to dispense and uh, utilize the funds that come. So in all, it's not a one-stop uh, activity of picking one and thinking that having one alone, you'll be able to achieve. No, you won't do, you won't do it. All this must be in appropriate proportions for you be, to, to be able to actually deliver on the money of uh, giving health to the people. And we know quite well that health, whichever we look at it, uh, it's, a, it's a social responsibility that government needs to do to give uh, people. Uh, just like you say, uh, security of life and property is a responsibility of government. To, high, to a very high level, the health of people is a responsibility of government. And uh, where you have the functional health uh, insurance activities, you find out that a good number of things can be done. Not health insurance that has no very good foundation. Uh, if you have 
good health insurance in place, and the primary health care, which is actually the foundation, uh, uh, it will go a long way in achieving some basic things. In the, the COVID that we are saying, it's when it is severe. Most of the people that come out of COVID-19, uh, we find out that they're becoming out of mild to, uh, mild to moderate uh, symptoms. And uh, the symptoms may not really be of the high fallacy one. So most times we'll be looking at the basics, the basics of uh, the health services and health activities, which, which lies within the purview of the primary health care. And, uh, you, the secondary and tertiary. So I think basically we have not uh, done too well over time. I even write from our first development plan to date. It's been uh, uh, plans that are not been executed, or if they are executed, they are not executed to the optimum maximum that you require to bear results. Mm -hmm. Even our budgeting, which uh, uh, has never met the requirement of a uh, uh, health required requirement as proposed by. Uh, various bodies to make sure that you get health at a particular level that most people will be better off for it. Okay, let me bring in Paul Alaje here. What do you think about the capital allocation to the health sector, at least in the last few years? Just uh, at the beginning of the program, I did give our viewers a rundown. We did our own analysis uh, here, uh, a rundown of health uh, budgets in the last 10 years or 11 years, 2010 uh, till now. Uh, what do you think has been rather flat or even reduced? What do you think? And just like doctor said earlier that this is the naked truth, with a pandemic now, it seems we are all getting naked in the market square. Yeah, uh, well, it's unfortunate that uh, those, part, those who are responsible for the health sector, they now need it. And unfortunately, they don't have anywhere to go to. They still have to use what they have not done over the time. Now, this is it. Abuja Accord that happened under the former Minister of Health, he had mentioned that Nigeria requires at least 15% of allocation into health sector. What we have seen over the years, in the, since 2010, just as you display, 3.7% to 2015, 5.5%. That is, that can never sufficiently take care of the population we have. So what it means is that the evidence of the results is what we now see, particularly in terms of primary health. You know, most of the figures we, we see, they are federal government, and people say federal government is the big spender. But when you look at how states have allocated funds to health sector, over the years, you will see there is major need for worries. And people have said even cases of health challenges that we have had in Nigeria, a lot of people don't report. So you just hear somebody slumped while he was in his sleep and died. And that is, that's just it. We believe that is God. And we should just forget about that. Another person is around that will continue and carry on. For us, if we don't deliberately invest on health, in our health sector, which includes the structures and infrastructure, which includes equipment and manpower, there is no way we can have a functional labor. That is why world, the world measure human development in the in fact. You cannot have development without developing health sector. Three sectors that you have to develop for you to say you have development is the area of health and education. Also, income earning capacity of the people and building prosperity for the people. When you fix this, infrastructure will follow and so many other uh, things that should be done, of course, will also be in place. But when we are talking about health, we can't talk about health sufficiently when there is no even power to generate, to power our hospitals. There is no sufficient power to power hospitals. For me, there should be a call for emergency, not just on next sector, but COVID-19, we should smell the coffee, declare emergency on the entire economy because health takes critical part of the economy. If you don't have health sector, you don't have any economy. India, one of the largest population in the world, by the way, the second largest population in the world, understood demand for healthcare, started fixing it. Today, many persons in the world prefer to go to India for health checkup, even for health. Get it right. There is no option for us other than to fix it. Allocate money not just to recurrent expenditure, but to capital expenditure. And my, my emphasis this morning is beyond just tertiary institution and hospitals that we are building. And so, now, these are health centers all around local governments and even world level. Because COVID-19 majorly we are counting 52. And I hope the number, does not, the number will not increase beyond that. 
The main challenge we may have is if this gets to ghettos, if it gets to rural area, these people we are talking about health, health clinic and all of they don't even have access to portable water. They don't have access to toilets, let alone health. So if it gets there, I am afraid it may get out of hand. Okay. And that is why we advise okay. government. Okay. Okay, Paul, let me just halt you a bit to bring in this and to, uh, for us to analyze perhaps the contribution of states at this point in terms of uh, into the health infrastructure. I'm, uh, I'm aware that there is a basic health care provision fund that was approved by the National Assembly in 2018. And if doctor is listening, I know that he will know this. Uh, the National Assembly approved it in 2018. The former Minister of Health, Isaac, Professor Isaac uh, uh, Adewale, did say uh, that of course is one percent of fg consolidated revenue uh, uh, fund as well as donor grants that makes up the fund but states are also supposed to provide counterpart funding uh, that's one of the conditions they also need to uh, come up with a state insurance state health insurance as well as a state primary development uh, board as at that time he spoke about he said about 22 states have not assessed that fund uh, what should we begin to do now in terms of this basic health care provision fund to, uh, to develop the state of health care in our various states? You want to take that before I come over to doctor? It's very common that m most states don't have good books. And when I say good books, they don't even know how to package themselves to access facilities. Federal government, apart from this one that um, was approved, and which, of course, a lot of states have not maximized, federal government even gave provision for a facility at a time and said states have to prepare their books correctly. Under the former Minister of Finance, um, uh, what's her name Kemi now? Um, yeah, Kemi Adiosho, which she put, but because she wanted due diligence, a lot of states found it difficult to access at the time. And so, you see, politicians need to understand that when you, are, when you win elections, either directly or indirectly, you are becoming the chief economist of that state, even though you don't have anything to do with it by economics, because unemployment figures will we ask you questions. Inflation figure domestic will ask you, big, will ask you questions. So what state needs to do is perhaps to ask from other governors or other legislators within another state that have accesses and ask, how do we begin to save our people? And you see, health conversations go beyond state. It even has to do with local government, even local government. So we need to first readjust the Nigerian system and believe that federal government is only a big brother. The other stakeholders, state and local government, must take active role and do their part in, uh, in, in order for us to have the kind of health sector we, have, we are all dreaming about. Okay, doctor, let me bring you, you in here. I hope you've been listening to our conversation. Um, I, I, I was reading the thought of a doctor yesterday. I said it earlier, and he did say that, why are we even so panicked about COVID-19, whereas we have other diseases in Nigeria that are killing people far more than COVID-19 is doing, he actually also did say, we have a lot of women that are dying daily uh, due to, they went to deliver their babies and a lot of them die. In fact, when I was taking a look at uh, some of the statistics uh, for under five child mortality, there are 89 deaths per 1,000 life births in Nigeria, a level that is far above what uh, the uh, SDG goal says about the target of 64 deaths per 1,000 life but maternal mortality rate is still high in the country. Nigeria still has a high incidence, prevalence of infectious diseases, which COVID-19 is, is, is a very contagious infectious disease. Our infectious diseases are very high. So how would you really calibrate all of this? We have other things killing people more than COVID-19, and we were not as this per top. Are you on the same wavelength with the doctor that I was reading his, his uh, thought yesterday? Neither am I saying that COVID-19 is not serious, but I'm just bringing all the thoughts together. Uh, definitely, I must say I'm not on the same wavelength with that. Hello? Yes, doctor, go ahead. I can hear you. Yeah, thank you very much. Well, I must say, with all sincerity, I'm not on the same wavelength with that doctor. It's part of the fact of some of those, uh, those uh, bad... Uh, 
in the things that he has recorded. But I must say, I want to appreciate uh, your guest, uh, Paul Alaje, who has made a lot of depositions with regards to the issues that affect health. I have I'm in total agreement with most of his submissions. Having said that, uh, for whoever it is, uh, we've not had a situation where the whole world is at a lockdown like this before. And it's as if all this while there hadn't been infant mortality, maternal mortality, infectious diseases, or, de or deaths from uh, non communicable diseases. All this happened there. But over and over again, uh, uh, we have always made this statement and called on the, the relevant uh, agencies and government on reasons why we need to improve our health services and healthcare delivery through the training, research, and service delivery components. And this has been one of the main cause of matter where professionals at uh, local health government. Uh, this, the, the statistics that have been given are facts, there's no doubt about it, they are real facts, but it is not at an overwhelming rate compared to what is happening in the entire world where everybody is affected now. Uh, it is only in Nigeria that like maybe you say uh, the fear is much more because the high level are the people that are at the uh, risk now. It is because they are the ones that travel, right, that for now, imported cases. But once they are already inside here and they start getting in contact with uh, people back home, you now start having local cases. And then this can permit as far to, to as many people as possible. So the point that we keep on making is still the same thing. We need to improve our health services in every ramification from point of infrastructure, point of equipment, point of manpower uh, development, training, and deployment of resources as, as are appropriate. You know, if these things are done, then a lot of these things that are, are being said, whether it's... Dr. Doctor, are you still there? I can't hear oh. you. Okay. Okay. Yes. Doctor, yes, you are now. I can hear you now. Right. So what we are saying is that we need to have so many things on ground to ensure that we get the best of things for people. But there is no way we can just keep one and then hold on to it alone. There is no time at, in this country in particular, we have said over and over, if we must improve our maternal mortality, if we must improve infant mortality rate, if we must improve the outcome of uh, antenatal activities and infectious diseases as they were, then we need to improve so many things. Immunization is there. That has actually reduced a lot of infectious diseases that are supposed to be childhood killer diseases through the, the, the primary health care activities. But we still need to get more. Uh, this, has, this, this is a very key area that we need to do. And in child spacing is a very important area that we need to Because once you have closeness of uh, deliveries, mothers have their own challenges, the children they bring forth have challenges. These are things that are increasing both in terms of uh, infant mortality, childhood mortality, and even the maternal mortality. Okay. These are preventable things that we can. Uh, but with regard to COVID, the main fact that it's affecting so many nations at the same time is a great cause, uh, cause, and cause, cause of concern for all of us, and everybody was all he can to see that he's able to safeguard uh, our own people as much as possible. Okay, doctor. Uh, let me bring in Paul here in the area of the Central Bank of Nigeria came up with interventions just about last week. Uh, intervention funds for uh, the healthcare sector, 100 billion naira to, for healthcare facilities and pharmaceutical companies. In fact, uh, for some companies, farm com that's pharmaceutical companies, uh, uh, should begin to take advantage of that. Um, how would you rate that? Is it a little too late, bearing in mind that some things are already happening, even if they need some infrastructure and all of that, the whole world is on a lockdown, or is something that is done right now to support the system? Say that I'm happy Central Bank came up with this. Um, when you look at uh, the counterparts, which I will call the fiscal authority, I've not seen so much of activity uh, coming from that, reg in, in that regard. And you see beyond Central Bank, NPC have also uh, tried to keep rates uh, steady, uh, all the major rates, uh, monetary uh, uh, indicators. So what Central Bank has done, in my own opinion, I think is very good to ensure that the system is not stifled. As we speak, not 
many civil servants are in their houses as directed by respective state government, FCT, and also federal government. Private sector, I can also tell you many people are at home. If uh, health sector is not improved, of course, there is need, there will be lag because if you access money today, it's an economic assumption to believe tomorrow you will quickly build the infrastructure, you, you quickly are dispensing. So it is better than never. It is better late than never. It is good that we are seeing this. And I also, I'm also of the opinion that, and I also think that central bank even went beyond the health sector. It looked at other sectors that might have been affected directly by uh, COVID-19, which I think is very, very, very good. My okay, concern Paul. Here okay, is Paul. Um, Paul, just hold on a bit because we have like two minutes to the end of the show. But let me chip in this question. Do you think that, that there are opportunity areas for investment right now in the health sector? And can private sector there take advantage of it? So there are a lot of opportunity, a lot of face marks that was 300 naira uh, before COVID-19. Right now, is about 7,500 naira. Uh, so if it is production, even if you are not selling to Nigeria, the rest of Africa, it's a lot. And you know what? Uh, Ebola. Ebola was, I think, 2014. Today, we are talking about COVID-19. We don't know if there will be another outbreak. So Nigeria should now learn to depend on itself and be the supplier for the rest of Africa. Remember that we've signed continental free trade agreement, which means that uh, we now have the single market, even beyond having uh, outbreaks from time to time, which may happen. How can Nigeria with 200 million population and with a labor force of over 80 million start to consider with deliberate action of government to support, not until we have pandemic outbreak, but government action using monetary and fiscal authority together to support private sector, to invest from their sector, to education, and most importantly, power sector. Then okay. we can say that many sometimes in the coming period, we may be okay. out of our uh, under okay. ourselves. Doctor, if you're still with us, just your final word as we I close the program today. There are still a lot of things I would have loved to ask, but time is not on our side, but we'll continue the discourse, definitely. Like at the beginning of the show, I said our life expectancy in Nigeria is 52 years old. I don't know with COVID-19 right now what it will be when the numbers are revised. <laughs> so just give me your concluding thought. It's not really an easy one for us in the country right now. Really, it's heartbreaking for me to say, especially in the state of health facilities in the country. What are your closing remarks? Well, my closing remarks is to call on the government to the kind of excitement and interest they have shown in this, this process. Let it be a continuous program on, on process until we are able to make our infrastructures available for people, equipment available, and the manpower within the system. And giving the manpower that refinery needs to remain within to do the work they're supposed to do. So let this excitement not just because of the pandemic. Mm. The pandemic, by God's sake, because and we, we must sustain and improve on what we need to do to improve our health care and health care services to our people. That is the only way we can talk of production. So we want to encourage that in the areas of manufacture, in the areas of production, and in the areas of uh, training, these things are really looking to both mm. in terms of pharmaceutical and in terms of equipment that are required in the health care sector. So Thank we don't wait to report it all the time. Well said, Doctor, that this excitement right now, I don't want to say, is it a negative excitement, talking about COVID-19 pandemic, that we should also extend that excitement to fixing uh, what needs to be fixed in the country. We should use this as a lesson and as an advantage to us. So thank you both for joining me on the program today. I've been, uh, thank you very much. I've been speaking with Paul Alaje, who is the uh, lead economist at SPM Professionals. He's speaking to me definitely from home, I can see. Uh, Dr. Omede, uh, former NMA president, Nigerian Medical Association president, as well as Commissioner for Health in Kogi State, former Commissioner for Health. Thank you again for joining us and be safe. That's the much you can take. Be the best you can be. Be the change you want to see. Say stay for everyone. Um, continually wash your hands with soap and water. Sanitize, sanitize, sanitize. And check out the sanitizer that it has above 60% or from 60% alcohol base because I'm seeing a lot of that around not having standards. So our standards or agencies should take note of that. I'll see you all. Bye for now.